Welcome to Lesson 16, More Properties of the Laplace Transform. I'm Ronald Johns. We're going to look at the Laplace Transform translation properties. There are two of those. We're going to see how we can use the Laplace Transform with piecewise defined functions, and we'll apply this to a spring problem, a spring attached to a wall, the other end of the spring is attached to a mass and will apply a force to the mass, which happens to be a piecewise continuous function. First, we're going to look at the Laplace transform of a shifted function. Let's suppose that here is the graph of y equals f of x. What we would like to do is to grab hold of this graph and shift it to the right by two units, and then let the new function be zero everywhere else. So what would be the resulting function, and what would be the Laplace transform of that resulting function? Let's suppose we have a function, let's just call it f of x, whose graph is given by this. And what we are going to do is to take this graph of f and we are going to translate it to the right by two units. So we get a graph that looks like this. Uh, Technically, this is now part of the graph of the function f of x minus 2, thought of as a function of x. The next thing we're going to do is to look at the function that includes this graph plus uh, this line segment here, where the function takes on the value 0, f this function evaluated at x equals 0 for x between 0 and 2. So we took the graph of f, we translated it over to units, and we uh, continued in our making of a new function by defining that new function to be 0 over here. Now the question is, what is the Laplace transform of this function that we now see on this screen. And secondly, why is it important to us? What sorts of problems will it allow us to solve that we could not solve before? In order to describe that function in a nice compact form, we need to talk about the unit step function. The unit step function is defined right here. u of t is equal to 0 if t is less than 0. It's equal to 1 if t is greater than or equal to 0. So u of t's graph is horizontal until we get to 0. It's along the t-axis. And then suddenly it jumps up to 1 and moves along horizontally again. If we shift that unit step function by an amount a, shifting to the right, we could look at u of t minus a. That's 0 if t is less than a, 1 if t is greater than or equal to a. The graph looks like this. Uh, u of t minus a is 0, sorry, in this case u of t minus 3. u of t minus 3 is 0 until we get to 3. Then suddenly it jumps up to 1, and it's 1 forevermore. The horizontal parts of this graph, right here and right here, those are really the graph of this function. This vertical line segment right here is not part of the graph of the function. Um, however, many mathematical software programs, including SageMath, like to connect points, uh, join, I guess, two points with a line segment, and it does this. Um, this part technically is not part of the graph. So let's look at the graph of f of t minus 2 times u of t minus 2. Suppose we have 
f of t minus 2 looking like this. Uh, it was the graph of f, which was over here, I guess, but shifted two units to the right. u of t minus 2 is 0 until we get to 2, then it's 1 afterwards. So what happens if we multiply f of t minus 2 times u of t minus 2? Well, let's look at, for instance, uh, t equals 1. f of 1 is some number, looks like it might be about 4. f, or u of 1, u, uh, u of t minus 2 evaluated at t equals 1 is 0. So 4 times 0 gives us 0 over here. So this part of the graph, when multiplied by the coordinates, the height coordinates of this part of the graph, just give us 0 here. Uh, for t after uh, 2, f of t minus 2 looks like this. u of t minus 2 is 1. Points over here times 1 just give us the same point over here. So what happens is when we multiply these two together, we get f of t minus 2 times u of t minus 2 being 0 until we get to 2. And then the uh, part of the graph of f, which was shifted to the right by two units. So now the question is, uh, look at this function here, 0 here, shifted f here. What is its Laplace transform? We'll have to go through a calculation to figure that out. So let's show that the Laplace transform of u of t minus 2 times f of t minus 2 is equal to e to the minus 2s times the Laplace transform of f of t. So uh, the Laplace transform of this stuff is just the Laplace transform of f multiplied by this exponential factor. So let's do the following. For notation, let's let the Laplace transform of little f of t be capital F of s, and let's let little g of t be the shifted function, f of t minus 2, u of t minus 2. So what I want to do is to find the Laplace transform of this, which means I'm going to find the Laplace transform of g of t. So the Laplace transform of g of t, by definition, is the integral from 0 to infinity e to the minus st times g of t dt. Now g of t is f of t minus 2 times u of t minus 2. So we'll just substitute that in. And then when we look at this, uh, the integral from 0 to infinity, we can break that up into an integral from 0 to 2 plus an integral from 2 to infinity of that integrand. Now we have an integral here, we have another integral here. Let's look at this first one. For t between 0 and t, u of t minus 2 is 0. So this integral is going to have 0. Integrating 0 dt is just 0. So this integral down here is going to disappear, same as this one up here. So all we're left with is this integral, which is the same as this one, I guess. Let's look at this one. Uh, here I have an f of t minus 2, u of t minus 2 dt. To get this to look like a Laplace transform, let's make the following substitution. Let's let w equal t minus 2, and in that case, dw is equal to dt. So when t equals 2, w is going to equal 0. As t goes to infinity, w will go to infinity. So instead of having limits of 2 to infinity for this integral involving t, we'll have an integral going from 0 to infinity of an integral involving w. Okay, now let's think about this for a second. Uh, f of t minus 2 is just going to be f of w. u of t minus 2 is going to be u of w. dt from up here is going to be dw. So what happened right here? Well, if we look up here, we have minus s times t. Now, what is t in terms of w? If we look at this equation here, t 
is going to be W plus 2. So that's what we substitute in for the T here, W plus 2. So we have this integral just involving uh, functions of W. Now, e to the minus s times w plus 2 is equal to e to the minus 2s times e to the minus sw. Now, e to the minus 2s does not depend on w at all, so that factor can be pulled out of the integral. And so what's left in here is the integral from 0 to infinity e to the minus sw f of w dw. And if you think about that for a minute, this is just the definition of the Laplace transform. So this is just e to the minus 2s times f of s. The only difference in this integral is that we have a w instead of t. If I had the integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus st, f of t times 1 dt, that would be f of s. And if I just change that letter to w all the way through, it's still going to be f of s. So what we have finally is Laplace transform of u of t minus 2, f of t minus 2, is e to the minus 2s times the Laplace transform of f of t. So this is the Laplace transform of this function that we see over here. Shifting the function to the right by two units, multiply the Laplace transform by a factor of e to the minus 2s. As you would probably guess, there was nothing uh, special about the number 2 when we shifted the function to the right by 2 units. We could have shifted to the right by any number of units a, a being greater than or equal to 0. And going through the same argument that we did on the previous slide, we would get the following. Laplace transform of f of t minus a times u of t minus a is equal to e to the minus a s times the Laplace transform of f of t. So let's look at a couple examples. Uh, first one, let's compute the Laplace transform of the sine of t minus pi times u of t minus pi. Well, uh, let's recall that the Laplace transform of the sine of t, we can look that up in tables, and it's 1 over s squared plus 1 squared. In other words, 1 over s squared plus 1. Let's think of this function here as capital F of s. Then, if we look at the Laplace transform of sine of t minus pi times u of t minus pi, that's just going to be e to the minus pi s, that exponential factor, times capital F of s. So that's going to be e to the minus pi s times 1 over s squared plus 1 squared, which we can simplify to e to the minus pi s divided by s squared plus 1. Now, let's look at a similar problem. Compute the Laplace transform of sine of t times u of t minus pi. Now, you might think, well, isn't that the same as what we have up here? No. Here we had sine of t minus pi. Here we have sine of t. This causes a slight difficulty because our translation formula is in terms of u of t minus pi, f of t minus pi. And so this is not in the form f of t minus pi. So we have to do some algebra, maybe use trig identities to get a function of t minus pi here. So here's what we'll do. Um, if we look at the Laplace transform of this stuff up here, u of t minus pi times sine of t, this sine of t I can write as sine of t minus pi plus pi. Okay. Um, so I just subtracted pi and added pi. 
I also put parentheses here to group these two together. So now if you look at this, I basically have the sine of the sum of two numbers, sine of alpha plus beta, let's say. And we know that the sine of alpha plus beta is equal to the sine of alpha cosine beta plus the cosine of alpha sine of beta. That's by the addition formula for the sine function. Now, cosine of pi is minus 1. The sine of pi is 0. So this stuff up here uh, simplifies to sine of t minus pi times minus 1 plus this times 0. So what we get is a factor of minus 1, which is here in the minus sign, then this function u of t minus pi, and then sine of t minus pi. Okay? And now we do have something in the form, we can pull the minus sign out front here because the Laplace transform is linear. We have something in the form u of t minus pi, f of t minus pi. So that's going to be e to the minus pi s times capital F of s. So what we get then is minus e to the minus pi s over s squared plus 1. This exponential times 1 over s squared plus 1, which was the Laplace transform of the sine of t. Here is a sage math calculation uh, illustrating those last two examples. Uh, our first command is to set variables s and t to be variables. Then let's take the Laplace transform of the unit step function evaluated at t minus pi times the sine of t minus pi. This stuff is a function of t. We want the Laplace transform to be a function of s. The next one we'll do is to evaluate the Laplace transform of the unit step function of t minus pi times sine of t. Where this is a function of t, we want the Laplace transform to be a function of s. So let's execute all of these cells and see what happens. So we'll run all of the cells. So for the Laplace transform of u of t minus pi times sine of t minus pi, we get e to the minus pi s divided by s squared plus 1, which confirms our first example's answer. And secondly, the Laplace transform of u of t minus pi times sine of t turns out to be minus e raised to the minus pi times s divided by s squared plus 1. And this verifies our second example's answer. So now let's look at a uh, second translation theorem for the Laplace transform. And here it is. If the Laplace transform of little f of t is capital F of s, then the Laplace transform of e to the at times little f of t is capital F of s minus a. So basically, multiplying little f by this exponential shifted the graph of capital F to the right by a units. So let's see what happens in the proof of this. So let's look at the Laplace transform of e to the at f of t. By definition, that'll be the integral from 0 to infinity e to the minus st times this function, e to the at f of t, dt. Now, using properties of exponents, e to the minus st times e to the at can be written as e to the minus the quantity s minus a times t. And then we'll have uh, the next factor, f of t dt. And if you look at this, what do we have here? 
we have the integral from 0 to infinity e to the minus a number times t times f of t dt. And that's going to be equal to the Laplace transform of this number up here, which is s minus a. So the Laplace transform of e to the at f of t is capital F of s minus a. So as an example, let's find the Laplace transform of e to the 3t sine of 5t. Well, let's do it in a couple of steps. Let's start with the simpler uh, problem, Laplace transform of sine of 5t. By our formula for the Laplace transform of the sine of at, this is going to be 5 over s squared plus 5 squared. So let's think of that as capital F of s. So then if I take that sine of 5t and multiply it by e to the 3t, take the Laplace transform of that, it's going to be a shift in this function up here to the right three units. And so we'll get 5 over s minus 3 quantity squared plus the 5 squared, which is 25. Now, if you look at this formula, uh, we really didn't need a to be positive in this, did we? Uh, this argument over here would hold even if a were negative. So that tells us there's a little bit more flexibility in this formula than there was in the previous formula that we looked at. So let's look at an example using that second translation theorem. Let's find the inverse Laplace transform of 2 over s squared plus 6s plus 20. Now, uh, when we look at this, we think, well, this could be uh, basically s minus or plus a quantity squared plus some number, perhaps. So let's try completing the square on that denominator to see what happens. So let's just look at this fraction for a minute. 2 over s squared plus 6s plus 20. We can complete the square and say that's equal to 2 over s squared plus 6s plus 9. These three terms are perfect square, plus 11 more so that we still have 20. OK, now these first three terms here can be simplified to s plus 3 squared. Uh, and then we still have the plus 11, numerator still 2. Uh, now, we like things like s squared plus a squared, don't we? So let's write 11 as the square root of 11 squared. And so this is equal to 2 over s plus 3 squared plus the square root of 11 squared. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'd like to have something like a over s squared plus a squared here. So I'm going to multiply and divide by the square root of 11, thinking that that's probably going to help me a little bit in the future. Um, so let's see. We know that the Laplace transform of the sine of at is a over s squared plus a squared. So if I look at the sine of the square root of 11 times t, that's going to be square root of 11 times s squared plus square root of 11 squared, isn't it? And that's almost what we have over here. Uh, and this factor is there. Don't forget about that. And so if I take this equation, multiply both sides by 2 over the square root of 11, remembering that the Laplace transform is linear, so this can be pulled outside. Uh, I now have this. The Laplace transform of this stuff is this. And it looks even more like this, doesn't it? The only difference between this and what's up here is here I have s squared. And here we have s plus 3 squared. Well, we know how to take care of that, don't we? Because we also had the Laplace transform of e to the at little f of t is capital F of s minus a. So let's do uh, a shift by multiplying by an exponential. We take this up here. And we're, instead of looking at this in the interior, Let's add an extra factor of e to the minus 3t. So Laplace transform of e to the minus 3t times the same stuff that I had up here is going to be 
this function evaluated at s minus a minus a, and that's going to be an s plus 3. And so uh, instead of having s square here, we have s plus 3 after, I guess you can say, shifting to the right by minus 3 units, which is the same as shifting to the left 3 units. But we saw that for this property, a could be positive or negative when we looked at the proof of that in terms of the integral. And so we get uh, this equaling the Laplace transform of this. And so now this is basically what we want uh, here because then the inverse Laplace transform of what we started with up here is the inverse Laplace transform of this, which is the same thing, just algebraically manipulated into a different form. And that's equal to what we had up here, e to the minus 3t times 2 over the square root of 11 sine square root of 11 times t. So we had to use uh, some completing of the square. We had to remember what the Laplace transform of sine of at was. We also had to remember that shift theorem that we just looked at. And putting all three of those together, along with some algebraic computations, allowed us to find the inverse Laplace transform of this, a constant over a quadratic denominator. So let's look at a spring problem with a piecewise continuous external force. So once again, we have a wall. A spring is attached to that wall. At the other end of the spring, a mass M is attached. Um, this could be in motion. There's a force due to drag. There's a force due to the spring by Hooke's law. There's an external force acting on this mass. We'll call that F of t. And we could have some velocity at a particular time t also. And x of t, once again, is the displacement of the mass from the equilibrium position, 0. And so let's look at x double prime of t plus 10x prime of t plus 24x of t equals F of t, where in this case, F of t is 0. If t is between, if t is less than or equal to 2, so it's 0 for t between 0 and 2. f of t is t minus 2, which is right here, if t is between 2 and 3. f of t is 1, if t is between 3 and 4. f of t is 5, if t is between 4 and 5, which is right here. f of t is 0, if t is greater than 5, and that gives us this part of the graph down here along the t-axis. So we have an external force in addition to all the other forces that we had before. This external force may be due to rockets attached to this uh, mass or somebody pushing on that mass in a certain way at particular time t times t. Uh, t being between 0 and, I guess, infinity here. Uh, but we'll look at this particular function. So there's an increasing push that decreases, then the push on the mass disappears. So what's going to happen to the behavior of this mass? How is it going to move? How, is, how can we find this function x of t that satisfies <coughs> excuse me, this initial value problem? So here, again, is our forced function that we just looked at. Here's its graph over here. And here's a way that we can write this function in terms of the unit step functions and shifts. Uh, the function starts off being 0, so I'll put 0 here. Then at t, of, at t equals 2, the function changes to the graph of t minus 2 
And it does that uh, for a little while, doesn't it? So here's what we'll do. At t equals 2, we'll turn off the 0 function, and we'll turn on the t minus 2 function. So we have the turn on function minus the turn off function. So now you can tell people that this lecture really turned you off. OK, then what happens at 3? Well, at t equals 3, we want to turn off the t minus 2 function and turn on the t equals 1 function. So up here, we'll have u of t minus 3 at t equals 3. We'll turn on the function 1 minus we'll turn off the function t minus 2. Then at uh, t equals 4, we're going to do something similar. At t equals 4, we're going to turn on the 5 minus t function, and we'll turn off by subtracting the 1 function. Then at t equals 5, we'll turn on the 0 function, and we'll turn off the 5 minus t function. So that will give us a term u of t minus 5 times 0 minus 5 minus t. And so this, uh, I claim, represents this function whose graph is given here, which is also given by this piecewise definition. Uh, one advantage of this is here we have everything written in terms of shifts and unit step functions that are shifts. And by those translation theorems that we had before, we can find the Laplace transform of f of t by just taking the Laplace transform of this term by term. Here's the code for plotting that piecewise continuous function. Let's let y be a variable named y. Let's let u of t equal the unit step function of t. Uh, this was just for convenience. Uh, I would prefer to write u of something rather than unit step of something. Unit underlying step is a predefined function in SageMath. So what we'll do is plot that function that we saw before, uh, u of t minus 2 times the quantity t minus 2 minus 0, plus u of t minus 3 times the quantity 1 minus t minus 2, plus u of t minus 4 times minus 1 plus the quantity t minus 5, plus u of t minus 5 times the quantity 0 minus the quantity 5 minus t, plot it for t going from 0 to 8. Uh, y min equals 0, y max equals 2, just specifies the range of numbers on the vertical axis. Um, our vertical axis will actually represent values of x of t. The graph will be uh, sketched in red. The thickness of the curve is 2. The higher the thickness value, the thicker the curve will be. Fix size equals 4, I included, to make a figure uh, that's not too large so that we can actually see the whole figure in our screen. So I'm going to uh, run this cell, execute the commands in this cell. And we wait for a few seconds. And here's the graph. As we can see, our function is 0 until we get to 2. Then after that, it's t minus 2 going up this way. Then here, the value of the function is constantly 1. Over here, f of t is equal to 5 minus t. And then over in this region here, uh, f of t is 0. So this is that impulse force function that we're using uh, together with our spring and mass system.
So let's look at the solution of the initial value problem. This first line here is just the differential equation. We had x double prime plus 10x prime plus 24 times x equals the force function, which we wrote this way in terms of unit step functions. Now let's take the Laplace transform of the left side and set it equal to the Laplace transform of the right side. That's what we have here. Because the Laplace transform is linear, the Laplace transform of all of this stuff up here could be written as the Laplace transform of this first line of stuff plus the Laplace transform of the second line of stuff. And that's what we have at this stage right here. Now, let's remember that the Laplace transform of u of t minus a times the function f evaluated at t minus a is e to the minus a s times f of s. That was one of our two translation properties of the Laplace transform. So looking up here, let's look at the Laplace transform of this term. Laplace transform of t minus 2 u of t minus 2 times t minus 2. Well, since the Laplace transform of t is 1 over s square, and since we have this um, translation property, then the Laplace transform of u of t minus 2 times t minus 2 is e to the minus 2s times 1 over s square. OK, the next uh, thing we take the Laplace transform of is this term up here. and so we want to find the Laplace transform of u of t minus 3 times, and if we look at 1 minus the quantity t minus 2, that simplifies to 3 minus t. OK, and you look at this and you say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, this is just the negative of t minus 3. And so what we'll do then is say that, once again, since the Laplace transform of L of t is 1 over s squared, then the Laplace transform of u of t minus 3 times t minus 3 is e to the minus 3s, 1 over s squared. So the Laplace transform of u of t minus 3 times 3 minus t, the negative of this factor, is minus e to the minus 3s times 1 over s squared. Now, similarly for the next term over here, the Laplace transform of that simplifies to the Laplace transform of u of t minus 4 times 4 minus t. And by using the same sort of steps that we had up here, we'll get that the Laplace transform of u of t minus 4 times 4 minus t is minus e to the minus 4s times 1 over s squared. The last thing we have to take the Laplace transform of is u of t minus 5 times the 0 minus the quantity 5 minus t. That simplifies to u of t minus 5 times t minus 5. And once again, since L of t is 1 over s squared, then using this translation property, L of u of t minus 5 times t minus 5 is e to the minus 5s times 1 over s squared. So what we have done so far is found the Laplace transform of every term that we have up here. Each of these four terms, we now know what the Laplace transforms are. So that tells us uh, what the right-hand side of this equation is going to be. So now what we need to do is evaluate this left-hand side. It'll give us something involving capital X of S, the Laplace transform of little x of t, and then we'll solve for capital X of S. And then we'll use inverse Laplace transforms to find the solution X of T to our initial value problems. So that's what's going to happen in the very near future. So far, we've seen that the Laplace transform of this stuff from our differential equation 
equals the Laplace transform of our force function, which is the stuff that we have over here. And this Laplace transform of these terms we saw was this stuff right here, e to the minus 2s times 1 over s squared minus 3e to the minus 3s times 1 over s squared minus e to the minus 4s times 1 over s squared plus e to the minus 5s times 1 over s squared. Uh, so the fact that this right-hand side equals this right-hand side was shown on the previous uh, slide. So now let's look at the left-hand side up here. Uh, the Laplace transform of x double prime of t. Let's remember that we had a formula for the Laplace transform of the second derivative of a function. And it started with s squared times capital X of s. And then you had two more terms that involved little x prime of 0 and x of 0. But both of those are 0 in this case. So the Laplace transform of little x double prime of t is just s squared capital X of s. Similarly, the Laplace transform of 10 little x prime of t is just 10s times x of s. And the Laplace transform of 24x of t is just 24x of s. So the Laplace transform of this stuff up here is s squared x of s plus 10s x of s plus 24x of s. And so that equals the Laplace transform of the right-hand side, which we saw was this. Looking at this right-hand side, we notice that every single term has a factor of 1 over s squared in it. So let's factor that out. Also, let's factor uh, the left-hand side. The left-hand side is s squared plus 10s plus 24 times capital X of s. And then on the right-hand side, it equals 1 over s squared times e to the minus 2s minus e to the minus 3s minus e to the minus 4s plus e to the minus 5s. Okay, so now let's solve for x of s by dividing both sides of this equation by this polynomial, this quadratic polynomial. Capital X of s then is 1 over s squared times s squared plus 10s plus 24 times this factor e to the minus 2s minus e to the minus 3s minus e to the minus 4s plus e to the minus 5s. So now we have to figure out how to take the inverse Laplace transform of this stuff. And to do that, we need to simplify this factor, make it into simpler fractions that we can handle using our Laplace transform tables. So let's expand this factor by using partial fractions. Um, we've used partial fractions before. We've reviewed the rules for that. Um, this time, we'll just jump to the end of the calculation for that. Uh, this fraction right here, this rational function of s, turns out to be equal to minus 5 over 288 divided by s plus 1 24th divided by s squared plus 1 32nd divided by s plus 4 minus or plus a minus 172 over s plus 6. And then for it to be equal to this stuff, we need that extra factor here. Okay. So now if we look at this, uh, we can say that x of s is this stuff times e to the minus 2s minus this stuff times e to the minus 3s uh, minus this stuff times e to the minus 4s plus this stuff times e to the minus 5s. And that's what we have written here. Uh, we just used uh, that property of multiplication and also these numbers to carry it along all the way through the calculation are fairly cumbersome. So I'm just going to use uh, four uh, variables to represent these coefficients. So a will be minus 5 over 288, b will be 1 24th, c will be 1 32nd, 
and d will be minus 1 over 72. And so we have that same second factor, this uh, that we got by partial fractions here, 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 and here. Once we use the distributive law up here. Okay, so we're making progress. We now can see that we have to find, for instance, the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus 2s times a over s. We also are going to have to find the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus 2s times b over s square. And the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus 2s times c over s plus 4, and so on. Going through all of these, uh, we'll have lots of inverse Laplace transforms to find. Uh, it looks like we'll have, I guess, 16 of them to find. Nobody said that this was a short problem. Um, none of the steps are difficult. It just takes time and lots of ink or pencil lead or a few maybe milliseconds of personal computer time using mathematical software to uh, compute these things. But we're going to show what you would have to do if you're solving this by hand. Um, and later we might see how we can use sage math to solve this type of problem also. So at this stage, we have found that capital X of S, the Laplace transform of lowercase x of t, is equal to this function of S that we see over here. So what do we need to do? We need to take inverse Laplace transforms of the left-hand side and the right-hand side in order to find the solution to the initial value problem, x of t. So x of t is the inverse Laplace transform of this first term minus the inverse Laplace transform of this second term minus the inverse Laplace transform of this third term plus the inverse Laplace transform of this fourth term, which is right here. So that was the easy part. Now we have to find the inverse Laplace transform of each of those. It's not going to be too hard, actually, because if you look at the denominators, um, this one is just a first power of s, this one is a second power of s, and these two are also first powers of s, and they are translates of this denominator. And so that's going to make life easier for us. Uh, we're basically just going to have to use, I guess, maybe three formulas over and over again to calculate the inverse Laplace transforms of all 16 terms. So far, we have x of t is the inverse Laplace transform of all of this stuff. And so what we need to do is evaluate this term by term using the linearity of the inverse Laplace transform. If you look up here, we need to find the inverse Laplace transform of things like e to the minus 2s times 1 over s, inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus 2s times 1 over s plus 6, and so forth. We also need to know the inverse Laplace transform of something of the form more or less 1 over s squared. And so those are the things that we're going to have to uh, consider. OK. Um, so let's uh, see what we can do to find the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus a s 
over s plus b, a and b being kind of arbitrary constants here. And we also want to find the inverse Laplace transformula, inverse Laplace transform formula for e to the minus a s over s squared. We need that to do something like the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus 2s times b over s squared here. Okay, so let's look at the first formula, this first thing, and see if we can find out what the inverse Laplace transform is of this quantity here. So I'll start with L of 1 is 1 over s, and let's just call that f of s. Then, by using one of our translation uh, properties, the Laplace transform of that function 1 times e to the minus bt is just capital F of s minus a minus b, the same capital F that we have here. Okay, so this is capital F of s plus b. F of s, capital F of s is 1 over s. So capital F of s plus b is just 1 over s plus b. Okay, well, we're getting close because here we have 1 over s plus b, but it's also multiplied by e to the minus a s. So how do we take care of that? We use our other translation formula. So let's translate this uh, by a. So the Laplace transform of 1 times e to the minus b times t minus a times the unit step function at t minus a is equal to e to the minus a s times 1 over s plus b. And that's exactly what we want. Compare that with what we have up here. So now just read this backwards. Uh, so the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus a s times 1 over s plus b is equal to e to the minus b times t minus a times the unit step function evaluated at t minus a. So we have successfully found the value of this inverse Laplace transform. So now let's move on to this second one. We have an s square in the denominator. Uh, so it seems reasonable to use this formula from our tables to start off with. The Laplace transform of t is 1 over s square, and let's call that f of s. So now let's shift that. The Laplace transform of t minus a times u of t minus a, shifting this by a and multiplying by that unit step function, that's just e to the minus a s capital F of s. In that case, it's e to the minus a s times 1 over s square. And so now, reading this formula backwards, we have the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus a s times 1 over s square is equal to t minus a u of t minus a. So that's all we need. These two formulas for these two inverse Laplace transforms are all we need to find the inverse Laplace transform of each term up here and thus find x of t. And you might say, well, where did that, where did the initial conditions go? If you remember, uh, when we took um, Laplace transforms earlier to find capital X of s, we used the initial conditions about little x of 0 and little x prime of 0 uh, to get to the formula uh, for capital X of s. And once we had that, we took inverse Laplace transforms to find little x of t. So those initial conditions are already baked into this equation that we have at the top here. Let's continue with our calculation. Uh, and we're going to be using over and over again three formulas. The Laplace inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus a s times 1 over s plus b is equal to e to the minus b times t minus a times u of t minus a, that unit step function. Um, the second formula follows immediately from the first formula. If we let b be 0, then this fraction is just 1 over s. What happens over on this side? If we let b be 0, this is just e to the 0 
times u of t minus a, which is just equal to u of t minus a. The last formula we'll be using is the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus a s times 1 over s square is t of s minus a times u of t minus a. Okay, so now we need to find the inverse Laplace transform of all of these uh, functions of s. Let's break it up into basically 16 terms by multiplying this out uh, and then using linearity of the Laplace transform, inverse Laplace transform. The inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus 2s times a over s, where a was minus 5 over 288, is just minus 5 over 288 times unit step function evaluated at t minus 2. That was using this formula right here. Okay, then the inverse Laplace transform of e to the minus 2s times b over s square, remembering that b is 1 24th, is 1 24th t minus 2 times u of t minus 2. Continuing this way, e to the minus 2s times this, plus e to the minus 2s times this, and so forth with all of these others. Uh, we get lots of terms here, uh, 16 terms. Let's not waste our time looking at all 16. Uh, you can gaze at them later if you so desire. But let's make a comment here. Um, if we look over here, for instance, we see e to the minus 4t plus 8. And uh, you might wonder, well, where did this come from? I don't see any 4t's and 8's up here. Um, what happened is, what happens, this was simplified somewhat. Um, look at minus 4 times the quantity t minus 2. That would equal minus 4t plus 8, wouldn't it? So this exponential here is basically just e to the minus 4 times the quantity t minus 2. Similar things happened over here, here, and so forth. Uh, so these actually do follow the formulas uh, that we have up here. And these terms right here came from this one with various values of b and a being used and then multiplied out by the distributive law for multiplication. So anyhow, after lots of tedious work, uh, these are the 16 terms that you get. This is the solution to our initial value problem. Uh, this will tell us the motion of that mass attached to the spring with that external force um, applied to that mass. Uh, and that external force, remember, was kind of a pulse. It looks something like a trapezoid when we considered its graph. And so uh, looking at this, this is not very informative as to what is happening as a function of time to that mass. However, if we graph it, that will give us a much better idea if this solution makes any sense. Does it seem like a reasonable solution or not? If it looks like the graph is way off of what we would expect, then perhaps we should go back and check our arithmetic and algebra. Let's look at a sage math plot of the initial value problems solution. In the sage math commands, we have that a is minus 5 over 288, b is 1 24th, c is 1 32nd, and d is 1 over 72. Uh, we have each of these assignments separated by, from the next one by a semicolon. Now, x of t was equal to all of the stuff that you see on the right-hand sides of these equations for x1, x2, x3, x4. So to get the solution x of t from this, we add 
x equals x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4. And then we can plot the solution curve x of t, t, let's say, going from 0 to 12. And we get a solution that looks like this. From 0 to 2, this uh, response, the position of the mass is at 0. Then the pulse of force kicks in, and the mass moves up to a peak of a displacement a little bit greater than 0 0.04. And then, as time goes on, uh, here we get down to t equals 5, somewhere right around in here, t equals 6. We can see that this curve, as we go out here, is getting closer and closer to 0. Uh, we do not see any oscillations here. And the reason that we don't see oscillations in this case is that the spring system we were looking at was overdamped. Um, remember, it was x double prime of t plus 10, x prime of t plus 24 times t equals something. If you look at the corresponding homogeneous uh, equation, um, the characteristic equation has two real roots, and so the homogeneous equation has exponential solutions. So what happens out here as t goes on is basically an exponential die-off without any oscillations. So the pulse of the force caused the system to start moving, but the motion was damped out fairly quickly. Let's look at another method for solving that same initial value problem with that piecewise defined force function. In this method, we're going to solve basically several initial value problems, one for this piece of the solution curve, another initial value problem for this piece, a third initial value problem for this piece, and a fourth initial value problem for this piece of the solution curve x of t. So we'll start with the solution to the initial value problem for t between 2 and 3. Let's remember that for t between 2 and 3, x of t was equal to t minus 2. So the first initial value problem we have to solve is L of x of t, in other words, x prime plus 10x prime plus 24x equals the force t minus 2. x at time 2 is 0. x prime at time 2 is 0. At time t equals 2, that mass is with 0 displacement and 0 velocity. So we solve this initial value problem, and that will give us a solution all the way up to t equals 3, where that piecewise the function piecewise defined function changes uh, by a different formula. So here's what we'll do. At this point A, corresponding to t equals 3, we'll compute x of 3 and x prime of 3 using the solution to this first initial value problem. Let's let alpha be x of 3 and let beta be x prime of 3. In that case, we're now set up to find the part of the solution between a and b, for t between 3 and 4. So we'll solve that L of x of t, this stuff, equals 1. x of 3 equals alpha. x prime of 3 equals beta. And we'll solve this initial value problem for t between 3 and 4. So that will give us the solution all the way up to this point b, corresponding to the point 4. Then we'll calculate the height of b and the slope here. Uh, and so let's let gamma be x of 4 and let delta be x prime of 4, where x here is the solution to this initial value problem. Once we have those, we can set up an initial value problem for this part of the curve by solving L of x of t is 5 minus t from 4 to 5. And then finally, uh, we'll find this part of the curve by solving another initial value problem where L of x of t is 0 
on 5 to infinity. Uh, for each of these, you would have to figure out what the initial conditions are going to be, and you're kind of bootstrapping yourself here because this initial value problem gives you the initial conditions for the second problem. The uh, solution to the second problem gives us the initial conditions to the third problem. And the third in, uh, problem in <clears throat> will give us the initial conditions to the fourth problem. So at each stage, we have to compute something at A to get this solution. We have to compute some things at B to get this solution. We have to compute some things at C, the height and velocity, basically, to get the rest of the solution. And then piecing them together, we get this uh, solution curve, which you can see looks a lot like uh, the one that we plotted before by using unit step functions and our translation theorems. This one didn't involve any translation theorems. It just involved solving basically four different initial value problems and piecing them together. So now let's consider a different initial value problem. It still is going to involve a mass attached to a spring attached to a wall. We're still going to have exactly the same uh, force, external force function that we had before, uh, but we're going to change one number. Uh, instead of a 10, we're going to have a 5 times x prime of t. So we're going to be solving x double prime of t plus 5x prime of t plus 24x equals g of t, where g of t is this function down here, defined exactly as we had it before. Now, if we solve this problem using, let's say, our alternate method, um, what we find is that the uh, value of x of t the position of the mass as a function of t uh, changes a little bit. Um, it has kind of almost well, a similar shape here, uh, but as we go along, uh, here's the first piece of the function, here's the second piece, here's the third piece, here's the fourth piece here. Okay. Uh, what we notice is this peak is somewhat over, I guess, from where it was before. Uh, but the most salient feature of this is damped oscillations here. After the force is turned off, after we get to an external force of zero, uh, we still have that mass on the spring doing some oscillations. And the reason is that if we look at this differential equation here, if we look at the left-hand side, look at the characteristic equation corresponding to the homogeneous uh, problem, the corresponding homogeneous OD, you would find that this is an underdamped uh, system. And because it's underdamped, we do get oscillations, but the damping involved, the damping is not zero, the damping involved will make the oscillations die out as time goes on. I would like to thank you for watching this video. I hope you have found it to be an enjoyable learning experience. If you're interested in ordinary differential equations, there are additional videos in the series covering most of the topics in an introductory course in ODEs. Have a good day.